thank you all for joining us today. This is our CFE faculty associate panel. Um, so these folks are folks who work with the CFB team on a very regular basis and they collaborate with us to put on a lot of our workshops and our learning communities and generally help with our strategic planning and getting the word out to all of you about uh, the CFE. So again, welcome to our panel discussion. We'll be hearing from several of our faculty associates today um, to discuss how our teaching has changed over the past couple of years. And we'll take a look into our crystal ball and think about what teaching might look like in the next five years. So I do wanna go over a couple of session logistics very quickly here. First, the uh, session today for our panel is 50 minutes with a light, we don't have lightning presentations, but we do have some, <laughs> some discussion that will happen. Uh, you can tell I copy and pasted this from another slide. <laughs> First mistake of the day. <laughs> Anyway, a 50 minute session with some uh, discussion about our teaching and learning if, um, in the past couple of years, how COVID has affected it, and then what to look for in the future, as I said. At the end, we will have a Q&A with our uh, panelists today. Um, so if you have questions that you'd like to raise, um, you can either put them in the chat, which we have enabled, or you can raise your hand and one of the CFE team will um, unmute you so that you can ask your question to the panelists. Um, today we are going to be using Poll Everywhere, which will help us create a word cloud to, to allow you to discuss um, the ways in which your teaching has been changed. And I'll talk about that Poll Everywhere word cloud in just a moment here. Um, as a reminder for webinar functionality, if you have a question, please use the chat while the panelists are speaking and the raised hand feature during the Q&A. Um, when you are, if you do raise your hand and ask a question, please make sure to use your microphone to improve your overall audio quality and the captioning quality because we do have the live transcript feature turned on for this session and all of our sessions today. Okay, so for the goals today, we're going to explore the ways in which your teaching practice has changed over the past couple of years um, with teaching online or going to emergency remote and what kinds of things you learned, what kinds of things you want to move forward with, the kinds of things maybe you want to stop and rethink um, in, the, in the future here. We'll also be discussing the future of teaching in our new normal. Our agenda for today includes our introductions, which we'll do in just a moment. We'll have an audience word cloud activity and the panelists will discuss that, um, you know, the, the word cloud results. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion of the future of teaching and finally end with a Q&A session. So to, uh, I'm gonna give you a chance to start working with Poll Everywhere. Um, the question we have is at the top of your screen, how has your teaching practice changed over the past two years? For the word cloud in Poll Everywhere, one word responses work best um, because what ends up happening is the, the words that show up more frequently are the words that are larger on the screen in the word cloud. There are three different ways that you can join Poll Everywhere. The quickest and easiest way is to use your camera on your phone to take a picture of the QR code. So you can scan the QR code with your phone's camera on and then click the link that pops up on your phone. I'm gonna put the Poll Everywhere link in the chat here just in case it would be helpful to folks. Okay, there's that. And if you aren't sure about how to use QR codes, I have a link for using QR codes for both Android and iPhone users. And that is the link I'm sharing now. In addition to using the QR code, you can also join via the web. If you go to pollev.com and you type in Chelsea Chandler123, um, that's the name of the poll and respond to the activity that you see. You'll notice that you can join the poll anonymously so you don't have to type in your name or anything. Alternatively, you can text text uh, Chelsea Chandler 123 to the number 37607. So the number that you'll text to is that 37607 and then type in um, uh, Chelsea Chandler 123. So 
as we're uh, doing our introductions, you can go ahead and start filling out your poll everywhere responses. Um, please remember that uh, I've allowed you to do one response just because we weren't sure how many folks were going to show up today. If you decide that you don't like the response that you chose, um, you can delete it by clicking on the little trash can icon um, below your response and you can type in a new response. So right now we're going to meet the CFE faculty associates. So associates, um, I'm going to call your names in order that they appear on my screen. Um, and so today we do have, um, oh, how, do, how many do we have? I think we have six of the faculty associates today. Lisa Hanasona wasn't able to join us because she is also presenting right at the second at a different conference. Um, so we've got a good turnout today. So it's really great to see, um, let's see here. So first up, Laura, I, I would like you to go ahead and introduce yourself. And if you could tell us a little bit about um, how you interact with the CFE and the kinds of workshops and learning communities and resources that you're helping us with. Um, so you can make sure to you know, tell people what you're doing so that they can come and see you. Great, good morning. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, so I am Laura Sheets. I'm an assistant professor in library teaching and learning at Jerome Library and the interim library instruction coordinator there. Um, and I, this is actually my first semester as a faculty associate. So I think I am the newest faculty associate on the panel this morning. Um, and I actually have a workshop tomorrow, tomorrow, Friday, uh, <laughs> uh, Friday about creating accessible documents and presentations. So if that interests you, um, please come and hang out with me Friday morning. Um, we're going to uh, be creating, talking about how to create accessible documents in Word and accessible PowerPoint presentations, um, which actually really um, dovetails with what we're talking about today, right, about accessibility. So um, I'm doing that uh, this week. And I'm sure we're probably going to be doing that um, workshop again uh, coming in the fall as well. Um, also in the fall, I'm going to be working on a learning community about information literacy, which of course is my expertise as a librarian. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so if you're curious about that, you can always you know, send me an email. We can talk about it. Maybe go have coffee sometime. Um, and of course, I'm also going to be working on some more workshops um, with the CFE, some other um, standalone resources as well. I'm definitely going to have some more accessibility um, resources um, for you all to have at your fingertips to work on that too. Um, and I'm also actually um, getting ready to hopefully publish an article soon about um, online teaching um, and quality matters and how that influenced my teaching during the pandemic. So that also kind of um, definitely is related to what we're talking about today. So that's exciting too. So I'm really happy to be here and happy to be working with the CFE. Great. Thank you, Laura. It's been a joy to work with you so far, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, just so you know, if you are interested in joining Laura for her uh, workshop on Friday, I believe you said that's when it was. Kelsey did uh, throw that in the chat. Kelsey, could you throw that in there again, the registration for Laura's workshop? Thank you. It kind of got lost. I put the poll everywhere information back up on the screen and did add the link again in the chat for you all. So next up, we have Dr. Allison Godey. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what you do with the CFE. Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you. Uh, my name is Allison Godey, and I work with the CFE. I, I think I've been on board now for about five years and have seen the CFE through many changes, including the transition to online teaching and learning. I was part of a team of faculty members who really helped with supporting faculty as they moved into the online learning space through hybrid um, faculty training sessions. Uh, in my current role for the CFE, I am a facilitator for the active learning classrooms. Um, I've partnered with a couple of the other faculty uh, associates here. I see Pat Lisk and Jerry Schnapp and Robin Miller uh, collaborating on a variety of different types of workshops to help support faculties uh, transition to online teaching and learning and using hybrid classrooms on our campus. 
Uh, for the fall, I am planning on helping facilitate a learning community uh, focusing on lesson study and higher education. And we do have a session this afternoon as a little bit of a teaser to really explore what the lesson study protocol is and how we might develop some teams here on uh, BGSU's campus to help support some of the academic learning goals that we have here at our university. Um, this semester too, it's probably not too late. Uh, you can still get a book. Uh, Robin Miller and I are co-facilitating a book club on disruptive thinking, which really focuses on what we need to do to prepare ourselves for the future of teaching and learning, uh, both in higher education as well as in uh, just our regular, our regular everyday operation. So thank you for letting me join you this morning. Thank you, Allison. And if you are interested in the book club, Kelsey has put the um, book club information in the chat. We do have the books available in the CFE office here in Olds Camp 103. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can go ahead and sign up and come pick up the book. Yeah, there it is, Allison. Thank you. <laughs> Good thing you don't have your screen mirrored so we can actually read it. <laughs> Okay, and next up on my screen is Dr. Robin Miller. Robin, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what you do with the CFE? Yes, um, my name is Robin Miller. Um, I, I teach in the School of Teaching and Learning. I think I've been with the CFE two or three years and uh, I run a workshop on uh, multimedia and how to use that in the classroom. Um, I've also run workshops on developing a web page and using gamification um, in your classes. And in the fall, I will be doing a learning community on gamifying. So um, that'll be kind of fun on how to add gaming and uh, different platforms into um, your courses, whether they're online or face-to-face. -face. So you can use those in both areas. Um, so I really uh, enjoy my, my PhD is in educational technology, curriculum and instruction. And um, I really like working with the CFE. It's been a lot of fun. Allison and I are doing the book club. So yes, if you'd like to join us, it's called Disruptive Thinking. Uh, we had a really good discussion last week and it meets on Thursdays from noon to one. It is on Zoom. Um, so you can kind of join it from anywhere. And i um, just really glad to be here and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, yeah, so same same applies. The CFE book club information is still in the in the chat there. Jerry, you're you're our next victim today. I am so excited to be here. I get to hang out with some of my favorite people and talk about my favorite topic, which is becoming better teachers. Um, so hi everybody. I'm Jerry Schnapp. I'm an associate professor of visual communication technology, and uh, love working with the CFE. Um, like I said, I love talking about teaching and, and uh, collaborating with other people to learn what they do to be better teachers, helping, you know, share with what, uh, share my experience, um, exploring uh, different ideas. And that's, that's kind of what I do in my workshops. I have a workshop on um, creating engaging online learning experiences. Um, there's a workshop on learner experience design. And um, the most recent one, which I'm, I'm going to do a sort of a mini version of it today, uh, for the past two years, I've served as the chairman of the Academic Honesty Committee. And the, the issues that we deal with um, having to do with academic honesty are, uh, I was surprised entering this role and seeing the, 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 the challenges that this committee faces. So if you'd like to talk about that uh, directly after this session at 11, um, I'm going to spend about a half hour talking about that. So glad to be here. Yeah, just a quick note on Jerry's session. Jerry does teach at what noon? <laughs> so his 11 session. 30. Was, yeah, okay, so eleven thirty. Like, yeah, back to back. Yep. <laughs> so that's why his session is a little shorter. We weren't trying to, you know, uh, skimp on his session, but it's like a quick teaser session, ready to go for academic honesty. Thank you, Jerry, for sharing that with us. Carrie, you are up next. So we've got Dr. Carrie Hamady. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. So I'm Carrie Hamady. I'm in uh, the Department of Public and Allied Health, specifically food and nutrition. So I've been involved with the CFE and um, the Office of Academic Assessment for quite a few years now. Um, so I know all of you, maybe if you've done a SAC report, um, I read those and it's wonderful and it's a great thing to link your learning objectives to the actual learning. So um, one of the 
uh, sessions that I offer is organizing your Canvas shell um, to really make it efficient, useful, um, decrease all those student emails that you get when they're confused about what to do and uh, linking your objectives to your modules. So I have one of those in April, so I'll plug that. April 11th, I believe. Um, I also do things on flipping the classroom and will hopefully then in the fall be offering a learning community on how to flip your, your classroom. And so I'll give that as a little teaser too, that I, I think that's something that's changed a lot in the last two years. Um, and then I'm doing a session today with my colleague, Dr. Mary John Ludi about, um, you know, incorporating DEI concepts across your curriculum. So that'll be, I think I'm at two uh, o'clock uh, today. So um, I'll end with that. Thanks so much, Carrie. And Kelsey, would you be able to put the um, registration link for Carrie's workshop in, in the chat, please? Thank you. Um, and just a quick plug, because Pat's going to be up next here. So this, there's kind of a, a you know, cross section here between their two um, areas of expertise. So Carrie, you're offering the flipped classroom of uh, uh, learning community in the fall. So Pat and Holly have been putting together our new faculty recording studio. So if you want to record really high quality videos for your flipped classroom, you can visit our new faculty video recording studio on April, oh, was it April 7th, Holly? April 8th. It's April 8th, Friday, April 8th. Thank you. Friday, April 8th from 11 to 1 p.m. Drop in, learn how to use the equipment. Obviously, there will be more guidance provided. Pat, I'll probably let you explain that. So, Pat, you're up next. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Patrick Lisk, and um, I am an adjunct instructor for both the College of Business and the College of Technology. Uh, but I'm also a manager in the IT department on campus. I've been with uh, I've been a faculty associate for like a few months so far, but I've been working with the CFE and many members of this group for a long time on a variety of things um, uh, related to both the transition and on, to online learning and just learning in general in the classrooms. Um, like uh, Chelsea said, I've had a, a, a pretty big hand with Holly. Um, I want to call out Holly for the great work she's done in this as well um, in developing the new recording studio on OLSCAMP 109. Uh, it is a phenomenal space that has uh, great acoustics. It has great video quality. We have a lighting kit that's going to make you look spectacular. I promise on that one. And uh, the audio that's produced is 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 truly top notch. Um, I know that this is going to dovetail into stuff I talk about later, but um, that's sort of the focus of a lot of what I do with the CFE as well. Um, we have a lot of students out there that expect high quality video and audio looking around at the, the other things they can see on the internet. So my first uh, session it talks about um, ways that you can you know, simple things you can do to improve your asynchronous content online and uh, become a better video editor in about five minutes. And then I have a workshop later um, in April as well that uh, you can come sit with me and we can talk about your online content and we can work together uh, to make sure you have the best possible videos for your class. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, everyone, for providing those really wonderful introductions. And um, thank you, CFE team, for putting in the links to the, the registration for each of those. Um, so if I could do a drum roll, I would, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and switch over to our word cloud and hopefully, fingers crossed, everything works OK here. It is populating. OK. Oh, gosh, I have to. We've got so much going on that I have to move my little screen here. Okay, so my job right now as moderator is to choose the top three words that are popping up on the screen. And it looks like some of them are still coming in. But by far, it looks like hybrid and asynchronous are the top two words that are coming in. Um, and I am going to pick another one because the other ones are uh, all about the same size. So we've got asynchronous, hybrid, and I'm going to choose the word adaptability or maybe a synonym to that would be flexibility because I think that with the words asynchronous and hybrid, that word probably goes pretty well together with those. So panelists, um, I would like to take a few minutes for you to reflect on and discuss the, the word cloud that you're seeing on the screen here. Um, so we have about 10 minutes for this activity. Um, so I'm only going to choose a few of you. So if any of you have like something very, very, you know, you're desperate to say that, um, you can go ahead. Oh, you can't. Oh, let's see here. 
You cannot see the word cloud on the screen. It's not showing up. Oh my goodness. Let's see. That's fine. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Thank you for that note, Kelsey. Yay. Great. Okay, so now it looks like we have a new word on there, a online, asynchronous, and hybrid. Uh, and we'll also throw in flexibility. So those are the top three choices there. Um, so let's see here. Um, I'm gonna have, Jerry, I'm gonna have you start first. If you wanna go ahead and discuss the word cloud that you're seeing and what your reflections are about those three, three particular words. Well, I think, um... The, the, the biggest challenge has been jumping in and um, learning how to use this technology that we haven't used before. The, a lot of seasoned professors who are so comfortable in the classroom found themselves completely uncomfortable having to switch to teaching online. Um, and the naive assumption is that, okay, we've got this computer screen and it's just like being in a classroom because I'm talking this way and students are out there, but it's not that at all. Teaching online is a totally different animal altogether. Um, it really um, requires a, a pretty substantial adjustment in, in pedagogy. I don't approach teaching online like I approach teaching face-to-face. -face. Uh, there's so, so many differences. And I think that that could be... Um, this this whole panel discussion really could could center just around around that. Um, I don't know what what do other folks think. I, I totally agree with you, Jerry. Our Masters of Food and Nutrition has been online. I, I mean, I started teaching it in two thousand eight, and it was there before me. So um, it, it's a very different preparation for a completely asynchronous online course. And then we kind of did this hybrid thing last year where students could, you know, come in Zoom or come to class. And um, that to me, I felt was extremely challenging uh, to remember. I've got people up on the screen. I've got people in front of me and I felt like a magician trying to make it all work. Um, but personally, I think, you know, we've learned a couple things here from the last two years you know, how did we even exist without Zoom before, right? Like we, I, I recorded, you know, my videos uh, on my Mac and I just kind of did that when I flipped my classroom. And now I have so many more options to make it more in, I don't want to say entertaining, but engaging for the students. And I think one of the best compliments I've gotten um, with using the the way I record lectures now is that students say, I really feel like I'm in the classroom with you. I feel like you're talking to me and not just reading a script. And so I think that comes with practice and it comes with just, you know, being comfortable in front of a camera that, and I'm kind of an, as you can see, an animated person anyway. So I really feel like I'm trying to talk to the students and then making those purposeful activities when they come to class. So I've pretty much given up on lecturing and, um, you know, just totally flipped the classroom where we're doing activities every day. So when I see asynchronous and online, those are the things I think about. Sorry, I I'll keep, jump uh, in if we can continue talking about this. Oh, I'll, yeah, go for it. I'll go segue. For it. Sure. I, what I found to be so much different would be, you know, as we're working in the online environment, we're really constructing a lot of materials for students to consume. And so we really have this design thinking experience going on where what you put in print and what you put in your presentations and how you prepare and structure your class really matters. And if you're just, you know, holding students accountable and, and having them interact with your materials, you also have to be just as accountable no one's perfect, but what you put in print and in video and in your and in your interactive design through your coursework really matters because the students all of a sudden you'll know if there's an issue, uh, you get 90 emails about it. And, and so managing your time has really also transitioned. Um, and one of the one of the most interesting feelings I had as we were making the transition is that Everything I said, everything I did, everything I put online, date, date stamped, time stamped, recorded, and held accountable. 
So big brother is always watching. And that's something that I reminded my students that we live in a different day and age where everything you do and say online matters because your digital footprint will always be there. So the concept of digital citizenship really began to emerge and um, being able to interact with the students online and holding them accountable has been one of the biggest transitions for me. I'll jump in here too. I'll jump in here too. Um, I think with, uh, especially like with COVID going online, I think that's caused me to try to find, and maybe it's because that was part of what I studied, but it's uh, caused me to integrate more technology into my classes to make it more fun, like the gamifications and, you know, certain things like that. Um, you know, just the multimedia and just how to create, um, I even did an augmented reality for one class and they, they really enjoyed it. Um, so I think I've expanded more. Um, it tried to make the classes more engaging, especially when everything was online. Um, so I think I've used more technology and research and sought out more technology than I would have if we hadn't have gone all online. One thing I found to help with the engagement, especially um, as we move forward in online and just standard classes as you're flipping your classroom, is that, you know, students don't want to sit there and watch a 30 minute lecture, right? And that was the one of the first things I did when we went hybrid is I recorded my first week's lecture and I got so many complaints of students like I don't have, you know, like in the classroom, 20, 25 minutes of lecturing, it's no big deal. It's interactive. We talk back and forth. But sitting and staring at a screen for that long can be, you know, really tiring and, and mentally taxing. So I've, I've gone out, I, you know, one of the things I try to focus on is not just recording shorter videos, but rethinking the way that I structure the content that I'm teaching so that it feels intentional that I'm talking about topics that are five to seven minutes long. Um, so if I'm going to, in a lecture, if I was going to have three learning objectives, how can I break that up into each of those learning objectives are in their own video, but still um, have enough tie-ins in between each video to make things seem like it was, you know, it was intentional to be that, um, to be designed that way. Yeah, thank you, Pat. I, um, I want to call out here um, that there are a few words on here in the word cloud that I think that we should probably pay attention to. And they're kind of have a negative connotation, but I would like to know that some of the strategies that you all have used in order to um, mitigate for the stress that comes with um, putting courses online it doesn't have to be emergency remote teaching, but you know it is time consuming, which is another word that's on here and can often be isolating for folks. Um, so if you could talk to those or speak to those three words, stressful, time consuming and isolating. Um, so Jerry, I saw that you had your, you, you were unmuted there for a second. So why don't you go ahead and start with that? I actually was going to, I unmuted because um, I wanted to um, uh, uh, say, say yes and to, uh, to what Patrick said about, about creating shorter videos. And, but I guess what, what I wanted to highlight was the, the why, you know, so you can get advice to, to make your videos shorter. Don't do 30 minute videos, do five minute videos, but why? And I just want to remind everybody that there are nuances, nuanced differences between going. Jerry, you are going yeah. to a classroom. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm talking and I'm touching touch pads. Uh, going to a classroom and 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 sitting in a lecture session versus how you engage with videos online students are watching your videos on their mobile phones and on their laptops and they've got them on their kitchen counters as they're making mac and cheese um, they have other windows open the expectation for um for for devoting um um their attention to the video is just different in that context. So like accept that and uh, and then adjust accordingly. And 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 Patrick's um, I think you know formula for for making that that th those educational experiences is right on point. And I know that's totally not what you were asking, Chelsea. So now I'm gonna now ask it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, Stressful, enough. time consuming, isolating. I know. I don't want to talk about that. That's all negative. <laughs> but how do you make it positive? How do you how do you change that? I I think the good news in that because I totally redid an online class last fall and it was time consuming and it was difficult. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, however, once you get that structure in place, 
it makes your life so much easier. So I think we probably all know that, you know, for anything that's worth it, you got to put some time into it and then it feeds you back. So um, I flipped my one classroom probably seven years ago and um, it was the most liberating thing I ever did. It was time consuming, but now that I've done it, um, I, I think that um, it, it really, in subsequent times that you teach that class, if it was a one-off class that I was just teaching to cover for somebody, I would not do it. But in, in our program, we tend to teach our content area. So I teach the same classes a lot. And um, like I said, once you get that structure in place, um, it, it really does cut back on your time. I feel if, if you're teaching face-to-face -face or asynchronously, once you get the structure there and you really make things purposeful and outline it, um, I find it then to be liberating. So I, I think there really is this great light at the end of the tunnel. And once you put in the work, um, I think you'll see the benefits from it. Tino and Carrie, I, I think of that often about in response to the why, um, and I think of the concept of paying it forward, you know, putting the time in prior to this meeting with your students and having an organizational structure for the content helps them make such such gains in your teaching practice. You, you, you get a return right away because you know then that the students, as you engage with them in your classroom, what, you know, it, it substantiates the reason why we bring them to our campus. If we could do this all online, we would, but what we found through this experiment that we had in transitioning to online is that there are certain things that students need to do, the effective domain of teaching and learning, how students feel isolated through the computer. And what brings them to campus is this lively learning community where they see each other's expressions. They have other when they know the content. And as an instructor, I can witness this if I empower them to do some of the thinking out loud with me while the content is being delivered. So it is time consuming, but the return on the investment of time helps me right away recognize that I'm not using their time to listen to me, where a video in short segmentation can be played back for deep concepts. And I, I'd like to kind of bridge that into the, the question that Sean Williams posed, having to do with, you know, what if you do have dense content that requires deep explanations? Unpacking that explanation is really the key and having a check back with the students. And it's, it's not easy and it takes concentrated effort. But once you know that you have the students on board, you can accelerate through the material and really understand where uh, their learning gaps may still exist. It's, it's not a perfect science, but it works and it's just far more engaging for the students and it, and it really does require a lot of concentration while they're there rather than having them multitask with their laptop, mobile device and you in front of the room. Thanks for that explanation, Allison. Jerry, I kind of want to kick it back over to you um, and then Carrie, because you both had kind of answers for what Sean had mentioned in the chat um, in terms of uh, being able to offer different modalities and switching back and forth, just like you would in a face-to-face -face classroom. You have to think about varying the, the, the different types of strategies that you're using within your course. Same for online. So Jerry, Carrie, do you want to, you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll um, offer a short answer, and I know Carrie's really good at this, uh, so I'll, I'll let her <laughs> right after me. Um, what's helpful to me is to set rules for myself. And so if you say, okay, uh, my asynchronous content, like if I do a video, it can't be more than four, min or four or five minutes, like that, that's just the rule. Um, then you find a way to condense the material into that. And if you say, yeah, but it's a really deep topic, I can't cover it in five minutes, Okay, break it up. Uh, the other thing that that is um, was a huge revelation to me um, was um, how effective cooperative learning can be. So cooperative learning, uh, which is a, a, a workshop I'll be doing next month, actually. Um, cooperative learning has to do with letting students through their own discovery come to concepts. Not you don't teach them directly. They come to the concept, and then when everyone comes together you 
debrief and sort of verify that they've hit the right learning objectives. It's really, really effective. It, that's such a great tie-in, Jerry. So I'm, I think probably a lot of us have noticed that students are feeling a little bit differently lately. Maybe they've lost some of their time management skills throughout the pandemic. They've lost their study skills as well. And um, the upper level classes that I teach are all application. And my seniors just said to me the other day, hey, we are struggling. Like you expect us to apply this information and we don't do that in all our other classes. We just kind of regurgitate information. So um, the last two assignments we did in class did not go so well. So, you know, I think part of the flipped classroom, it, it allows you to have the freedom to change what you're going to do. So I have a bunch of activities in my toolbox and kind of depending on where my students are, okay, today we're gonna to do this activity or that activity. And so yesterday in class, actually, I said, we're just redoing this, here you go. So I've created these feedback forms for both my totally online courses, my asynchronous online and my in-person. So if they didn't, if I, we did something that I'm like, oh, they really didn't get this, very well, we go back with that feedback form. And I said, redo this section and then give me the rationale why. And yesterday was probably the most fun we had in class. Everybody was like, I can't believe I wrote this on the assignment. Now that I reread it, like I was so wrong. And I'm like, this is learning. This is learning. And you're teach, you know, you're, you're getting it yourself. And I'm walking around and everybody had a smile on their face and everybody was working. They working in pairs and talking to each other, talking to me. And I was just like, you know, sometimes you got to pull back and say, maybe this wasn't on the agenda for today, but the students are struggling and we need to break this down and talk it through. And so I've never done that before. And it was, it was a great experience. Okay, so Laura, I'm gonna invite you to share your comment um, about the, the sometimes negative aspects of um, online asynchronous hybrid teaching and self stressful time consuming and isolation that you might experience with those. Yeah, so and I think that, you know, I'm definitely the anomaly on the panel and also librarians are kind of the anomaly in teaching practices where we do teach credit bearing courses, but most of the time we come in as a, like a one-shot model, one time in the classroom where we're invited, you know, to come. Um, so we don't have a lot of agency or power necessarily. Thank you, Carrie, um, <laughs> for um, in the classroom. But um, so we really kind of struggled during, you know, the online teaching, especially during that last um, portion of 20, the 2020 spring semester where we really had to get creative, right, as to how are we actually going to um, reach our students and connect with our faculty. So we did a lot of asynchronous um, learning objects that we created. We did a lot of like um, Canvas modules um, that we created that we actually um, pushed out to faculty. So a lot of asynchronous teaching, which was very time consuming. Um, and so we really the model that we practice was to create um, learning objects that could be reused um, by lots of different librarians for lots of different courses. So that was kind of the strategy that we used to make it less stressful and less time consuming for all of us is that we tried to create these learning objects and media that could be reused by lots of different people. So we didn't have to recreate the wheel constantly so that we could, you know, um, create things that could be reused over and over and over again. So that was kind of our strategy to help each other and kind of um, reduce some of that stress. Thanks for sharing that with us. Yes, you do have such an important role with the university, um, being able to share your knowledge about not just like picking up a book and finding books. It's, it's way, way, way more than that. And we've been learning a lot from you, Laura. So I, I do thank you for that. Robin, I want to end with you for this section um, and discuss, uh, let's move away from some of the negative aspects, but discuss the joy you've been able to find in, in teaching over the past couple of years, despite everything that's been happening in the world and in our communities. So Robin, if you could share, you know, just one or two thoughts about the joy that you found. 
Um, what I started doing, because um, when all there was all the online classes and everything, um, you know, and it seemed like there was a lot of stress and anxiety among the students. One uh, exercise I had them do, and it was a personal thing, so it's not like anybody from the other class saw these things, but I asked them just how are you doing? Could you please take a picture of yourself or a video and just write a few words or put it in a video about some of the challenges, any ways I can help you? Um, and I found that the students really appreciated that. And I said, this won't be shared with anyone. I'll be the only one that sees it. So, you know, if you need to talk or need something personal, that's fine. And I mean, I had so many students do this. I mean, it was, it was more optional too, but I mean, I had just an entourage of students. They were, it was like they were just wanted to connect. Um, and I found that activity be very fulfilling for me. And I think it was very, they just said that they really appreciated somebody that actually cared about them and, you know, how refreshing they thought that was. So, you know, those are probably not things I necessarily would have done if we hadn't gone on online, you know, like if it's face to face, if a student has an issue, they can talk to you after class, you can kind of interact with them, but they really got, you know, we're just really, really appreciated um, that. And I, I think, you know, one thing too, I think it, we do see how vulnerable we are as human beings and how we need that connection to other human beings and how we need that personal contact um, and just that interaction with others. And I think that, um, the pandemic has showed us just how important other people are to us and, and how that human interaction is, is key to a lot of success. Um, but I, that, that really struck me just some of the things the students told me, I don't know that they would have told me that in person. So on the other hand, you know, that, that did bring out, I think some honesty with students as well. So that was just something I noticed over the last couple of years. Thanks for sharing that, Robin. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Um, so since we're on the topic, I do have a book recommendation. Julie also recommended a book. Um, let's see here. It's uh, called Generation Z Unfiltered by Tim Elmore. Um, so the book has been eye-opening, pointing to areas we may need to adjust our ex expectations in terms of skills and orientations to learning we assume students have when entering college. So um, another book recommendation more on the faculty side of things, my screen is flipped so you can't read it, um, is The Productive uh, offline, Online and Offline pers uh, Professor, A Practical Guide by Bonnie Stachowiak. She's the um, she's the uh, 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 professor, um, I can't remember the university, but she leads the Teaching in Higher Ed podcast, which is also a great resource for folks. Um, so it's just a small book with really practical tips about how to manage your time um, and how to teach online without it, you know, consuming your entire life. Um, so that might be helpful as a refresher over your summer break. I can't believe I'm saying the word summer right now, <laughs> since it's kind of cold and rainy out today. So we have about seven or eight minutes left for our session today. And I was wondering, um, since we've kind of had a lot of interaction in the chat, if we wanted to go ahead and do our crystal ball activity where you look into the future, faculty associates, I'm gonna give each of you about a minute to say your, um, your thoughts and ideas about what teaching is going to look like in the future. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we have all of you on our um, screens here and we can see each of you. So um, let's see here, I'm gonna start from the end. Robin, I'm gonna kick it back to you since you uh, are the last person on my screen and I'll work backwards this time. Robin, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, what <laughs> was you. the question just real quick? You said- Yeah, yeah. Um, if you could share with us what your thoughts are about the future of teaching sure. over the okay. next five years. That's what I thought, years. but then I was like, well, I want to make sure I answer this question right. Yep, um, definitely. I think that with the pandemic, um, I think over the next five years, we're going to have kind of a integration of both online and face-to-face. -face. I think we're going to use some of the things that we've seen online um, the good things about the online, I think will stay. And I think the bad things won't. I do like to have, I think meetings, it would be nice for that to be about 50, 50, because it is nice to have a virtual meeting, you know, so that, that I think was a positive. 
Um, it's kind of like you can, you know, do too much of a good thing. I don't think it should be every meeting, but I do like, I do like how that came out with the meetings. I think as educators, um, the technology is there to stay. Um, I think the options are there to stay. Um, and I think we'll continue to be face to face, but I think there'll always be that little caveat of the online component where we probably wouldn't have had that before. I think it'll give us more opportunities, though, to collaborate. And like we're talking about research, um, a lot of these video conferencing has opened up a lot of things with research where we can collaborate with people in other countries where maybe that's not something we would have done before the pandemic. So I do think um, some of the good things will stay. I think some of the bad things will go. Um, but that's kind of how I, I don't think the technology we've used or the pandemic will ever go away. And I don't think it should. Um, so that's kind of my take on that. Thanks, Robin. I, I appreciate that thinking about, you know, the kind of the stop, start, continue um, notion about, you know, thinking through that with your own teaching practices. Laura, I'm going to have you ask the, or answer the same question. You don't need to ask it. <laughs> I think just building upon what Robin has said, like I, th I think libraries, li libraries in particular have been thinking about this question for a while. Like when we think about the on-campus student versus a distant student, that definition has been blurring for us for a long time in terms of what we think of the resources that we present to them. Um, but I think that that line is just going to continue to blur. And when we think about a distant student versus an on-campus student, that definition is almost going to be non-existent um, because even the you know, the face-to-face -face classes still have an LMS online presence. So I think just the skills that we as teachers need in terms of like instructional design skills and, and technology skills and things like that are just going to have to increase. Um, and those kinds of best practices that we need to have in our toolkit, we're just going to have to keep building those skills more and more. And I think that when we think about what traditional quote-unquote um, on campus students need and what distant students need, those things are just going to continue to blend and be the same. Thanks, Laura. I, I appreciate your mention of instructional design skills and building up our technology skills. That's one thing that the CFE does. We have instructional design consultations and academic technology consultations. Quick plug there before I hand it over to Carrie to share your thoughts. Yeah, real quickly, um, I think I would say we have to continue to be more flexible. As, as I, I mentioned before, I think COVID has really um, had some deep effects on students and we have to realize that maybe they're not going to enter our classes with the knowledge they had before and or they might need those second chances because at the end of the day, my teaching philosophy is that students should learn. And I don't care if you, know, if you didn't pass something, come back, I wanna know that you learned it. And I think that's the most important thing to me. What a great elevator pitch for your teaching philosophy. Students should learn. I really like that. Allison, I'll have you go next. I had to find my mouse. Uh, thank you. And I actually in, am very much in tune with the, the comments of the, of the others who have really spoken aloud about what we should expect. And I'm going to pull from, from Eric Shininger and really think about this disruption and what is so serendipitous about this is that everybody at the same time, no matter who we were or what age we were or what area of expertise, we all experienced this. So what we learned from this experience really needs to be brought forward and we need to continue to build and recognize things we can do automatically and things that we can do as a human. And the more our students see us as humans, the better off we're going to be and help help facilitate their learning for their future because it's unimaginable and prefigurative because of what has happened with us. We can only imagine what the future will bring, but we need to prepare our students to be lifelong learners because many of them have decades ahead in their careers as well as in their lives. And we're, we're their coaches now. Thanks, Allison. What, what great points you make. I, I appreciate those. And um, Pat, I'm going to have you go next and then we'll end with Jerry here. And we do have quite some action in the chat going on. So keep looking at that too. So um, I think that a lot of people touch on, and I just want to reiterate a little bit, is that I think we're all in this together, that 
um, like one of the things I said earlier is that students watch YouTube channels that have high quality video content. And what they don't understand going into that is the, the, those YouTubers have someone that helped them set their, their equipment up. They have someone else editing their videos. They have someone else adding after effects to their content. So I think that collaboration is and skill assessment is going to have to change in some extent to that some people are going to be able to do a little bit of everything but i do think in the next five years you're going to see uh colleges and schools start to hire people who just develop videos like that's their job they don't necessarily teach a course they work with faculty to create or edit their videos for them to create that higher engaging level of content um, and, I, and I think what we can do to prepare today is just to continue these conversations that we're having between faculty members um, to, to make, you know, to handle isolation in, in addition to helping us, you know, what has worked for you? What's, what are some quick tips I can do to just shave five minutes off of what I've been doing? Some great. really great practical tips. Oh, sorry, Jerry, you're next. <laughs> yeah, um, th th this is such an amazing discussion and I agree with everybody. Um, I wanted to add though that, um, so the, the, you know, the pandemic was a shakeup and it made us sort of re rethink things. Um, I, I don't know about everybody, but I'm feeling like we're sort of getting back to normal. Like I'm feeling for the first time in a long time, I'm really feeling like, like, like I felt a couple of years ago, the way that I'm connecting with students, the way that just sort of the atmosphere is. And, you know, I, I hope we continue on in that direction, but the, the pandemic, the changes that the pandemic um, ushered in, um, there are some things that are here to stay. And, and I think that at least what I'm hearing from everybody is that technology is one of the biggest things, um, <clears throat> meaning that teachers, educators, um, there's not an option to be an edu a, a, a technology um, it's not an option to include technology. You have to, okay. And um, echoing what Patrick said about having high production videos, you kind of have to have high production everything in terms of your technology. You can't fumble around. You just need to get really comfortable with it. And so, and by comfortable, I mean like a virtuoso musician is comfortable with their instrument. Like it's just part of you, right? Um, there's no other way to do that than to practice. And so. Um, you know, advice to becoming very comfortable with tech is to jump in and just embrace it and start using it. It'll be clunky at first, and then you'll just get more comfortable. Thanks, Jerry. And I wanna kind of add one final thought as we wrap up here. Um, I think that the one thing that I would add is being humble. Um, when you make mistakes, uh, my I laugh at my mistakes. Obviously I've made mistakes today in our, in our own presentation. We're, you know, we're experts in the field. Um, and so just being humble with your students and making your students understand that you too are a human and you make mistakes and you don't know the answers to everything. That goes for whatever modality that you're teaching in. And it's the same for each of us here. We're human, we don't always know the answers, but we really want at the CFE to really kind of figure out those answers together with you in community. Um, and be able to work with you and learn from you as well. Um, and so with that, thank you all for joining us today. Since we had such a robust discussion and we had a lot of action in the chat, um, we've kind of gone over our time for the Q&A and I wanna make sure to give our panelists a short break before they have to jump in and do their own presentations. Um, please remember to visit the teaching and learning website. Kelsey, could you pop that in the chat please? So that you can click on your concurrent session Zoom link. Um, and please remember that those Zoom sessions will be regular meeting sessions, so you will be able to see everyone who's in the call with you. I really appreciate um, take you taking the time to join us today. Thank you so much, faculty associate panels, th panelists. Thank you, CFE team. And we'll see you back in the same webinar at 12 p.m. for our keynote with Dr. Thomas J. Tobin. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>